you have your Bibles, again with the backdrop and the thought in the back of your mind being about discipleship and disciples, turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. So this is just some conversations I think about discipleship. Think about the sovereignty of God. It's amazing that God calls certain. We are all called to get right with God. We're all called to salvation. We're all called to worship God. And then God chooses a few people to do a few other things above and beyond the call of duty. And why is that? Psalm 139, verse 13. This is just the beginning of that. Let's take a look at that. David writes, verse 13, Psalm 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days, of, uh, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. This speaks of the sovereignty of God. Before I was formed in the womb, you knew me. Before I took my first breath, before I walked on the earth, before I, uh, before I lived my first day, you completed the story of my life. That's amazing. God already knows what we're going to do. He knows, he knows the end of the book. And I, and I say that in this backdrop, why did he call certain people to be disciples? Why did he call certain people to be preachers? Why did he call certain people to be doctors? Because he knows exactly how you are made. <clears throat> and he knows your raw material. Now whether we are obedient or not, that's up to us. But God knows what we're made of. He knows what we can be great at. He, given, he has given us all talents. And along these conversations, one of the conversations, they said, what about these talents? What about these things that we have? Well, some people are multi-talented. You think of somebody like Michael Jackson, extremely talented. In my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen a more talented individual than Michael Jackson. He's incredible. Of course, he's gone. But what about the person that says, well, I don't have a whole lot? Again, this conversation came up. Well, you have a body, don't you? You have arms and legs that move, and God says, when I trust you with a little bit, if I can trust you with that little bit, I will trust you with more later on. Some people have five talents, some people have two, some people have one. And you know the parable. The guy that had five talents used the five, he got five more. The guy that had two used the two talents, he got two more. The guy that had one decided, I'm not going to do anything with it, I'm going to bury it in the ground. And what did God do? You were an unfaithful servant. I'm going to take the one you have, and I'm going to give it to the guy that had the five and actually used his talents. So you have a body. This is your talent. You can walk around, you can move around, you can think, you can interact with people. Are you faithful with what God has given you? He knew you. He wrote your book. He wants to use you. And if you turn into Jeremiah chapter 1, it's the same thing, very similar. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. Before baby Titus Paul was born at 12.03 Thursday morning, God knew him, knew his entire story. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you. God made you, God sanctified you, God positioned you in a specific place to be used for a specific reason, always to glorify Him. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And He's, ah, oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you. I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and the kingdoms to uproot, tear down, destroy, overthrow, to build and to plant. 
How many of us have ever said, I can't do it? Can't do it. I'm no good. Never going to make it. You see these tests on Facebook that say we're never going to amount to anything, basically. But God says, how many of you have actually came to me? How many of you have actually came to me and said, God, I can't do it on my own? So we're freelancing. We're out there working on our own. We're working on our flesh. We're overwhelmed. And God says, but did you ever ask me? And so this is where this comes in. Side note. Somebody asked me this week, why is there evil in the world? How can a loving God allow evil in this world? A loving God never designed evil to come into this world. We bring evil into the world. When, we, when Adam and Eve went to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they already knew good. It was their decision to bring evil into this world. And God allows us to live out the results of some of our choices. So I just wanted to throw that in. Sorry. That was another question I had this week. So... God's sovereign, election, selection, not necessarily for destiny, but for position, for calling, for purpose. And this is what we have today. God knows you, but what does the world do? How does the world look at this? Um, and we're going to use Peter in a minute. I'm going to use a quote from this book, uh, 12 Ordinary Men. I've told everybody this is the book I'm reading right now. This is one of the books I'm teaching out of. And on page 44, John MacArthur as a very interesting thing in this, in this situation came up this week. MacArthur writes, Recently I read the results of a study involving all the young people in America who have been involved in the epidemic, and this is an epidemic, by the way, one in every seven days about, uh, uh, an epidemic of school shooting rampages. It turns out that the common denominator among the shooters is that virtually all of them are young people who are prescribed Ritalin or some other antidepressant drug to control their behavior problems. Now, a side note, there are some people who legitimately need this. Some parents use it as a cop-out or a crutch. Instead of being disciplined for wrong attitudes and bad behavior, they were drugged into a stupor. Instead of training them to behave and teaching them self-control, child psychologists prescribe mind-numbing drugs that only temporarily Cure, uh, curb their rebellious behavior. The defiant, rebellious attitudes that were the root of the problem were never confronted or dealt with. Those kids had been artificially sheltered from the consequences of the rebellion in their younger childhood. And then I see these sometimes, as I spoke with a pre uh, teacher this week, who says, I try to do the right thing, and the parents come in and want to beat me up. This is what happened. They've been sheltered. They're sheltering their child instead of letting them be confronted and have accountability. They miss the life experience that might have shaped their character differently. This is the world's way. This is not the church way. We need to confront the issues with our children. We need to discipline our children. We need to train our children, not have an excuse and give drugs and temporarily curb your behavior so you might get a Great. But there are kids, I say, there are some that are legit and do need medication. But what we're missing when I talk about drugs is we're missing that opportunity to engage our children instead of putting it on something that we, that we, uh, we don't even understand for the most part. How many times like we, when I've disciplined, say, for example, Joshua, or some of you have disciplined your children here, I know, to sit down with them and tell them exactly why, for example, they got a spank. I think I spanked him the last time. He was under seven years old. And I haven't had to do it again. I just had to count. One, two, three was no negotiation. And that's all he needed. And I would sit Josh down and say, buddy, do you know why I had to discipline you today? No, Dad. Or, or he, some, most of the time he would say, yeah, I didn't really listen, did I? No, yeah. I said, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel good to discipline you, but I discipline you because I love you. I don't want you to be a drain on society. I don't want you to be somebody that has to be on some program your whole life. I want you to be a contributor to society. So I discipline you. I train you. And I work with you. And I love you. The world is not doing that. We as Christians need to do that. And we need to bathe all of that in prayer and all of that in love. And I'll tell you why I'm doing that. Because Peter, for example... The disciple, or the apostle Peter, 
is somebody that Jesus had to deal with on a regular basis. The, the, the example of discipline and training is right in the Bible. And here's an example, again from MacArthur. Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels more than any other name except Jesus Christ. No one speaks as often as Peter. No one is spoken to by the Lord as often as Peter. How many of you have had that kid in your classroom? Most of the time, though, isn't it true if you deal with that kid and he comes out and he says, one day, thank you. I know I was a troublemaker, but you took the time to care and work with me. Thank you. Ever had that one? This is Peter. <clears throat> no disciple is so frequently rebuked by the Lord as Peter. He's not on Riddler. He's not on drugs. He's not on some program. He's not set before a game machine and say, sit there till I'm ready to deal with you. And no disciple ever rebukes the Lord except Peter. That's in Matthew 16. No other disciple has ever verbally denied Christ as forcibly or as publicly as Peter. No one is praised and blessed by Christ the way Peter was. Peter was the only one Christ ever addressed as Satan. How many of you had that kid in your class? I might have been that kid. Once. I had a good teacher. The Lord had harsher things to say to Peter than he ever said to any of the others. But no one else confessed Christ more boldly than Peter. Isn't that something? The fiery trials that Ron talked about this this morning. The fiery trials we go through. The hard times we go through. But the, like for example with the three children that were thrown in the fiery furnace. They were thrown in a trial and they would not deny Jesus Christ. Guess what happens when you don't deny Jesus Christ? When you get thrown in that fire, the bonds fall off. And when people look at your life, they say, wait a minute. How are they doing this? And when the three brothers were thrown, I don't see three anymore. I see four. I don't see Steve anymore. I see two. I don't see Jamie anymore. I see two. I don't see Becky anymore. I see two. What does that mean? When people see you going through the trial and you stand strong and you stand with your Savior because you've been trained, because you've been disciplined, because you've been loved, they don't just see you struggling. They see the confidence and the strength you have in your Savior who has loved you, who has disciplined you, who has walked with you, and is willing to go through the fire with you. Again, on those conversations... Jesus doesn't want to walk along a person as they continue with their sinful life. He'll let you go. He'll let you go down that path. He'll let you reap the results of your bad decisions. He'll let you hit rock bottom. But the moment you repent, he'll jump right in with you and then walk alongside you. So instead of three, there's four. Instead of one, there's two. And so... So in time and in, with drugs and with programs, kids are pawned off, set in front of devices instead of people saying, I'm going to take the time to shut everything off, to spend with this child, to spend with this Christian, to spend with this brother or sister in Jesus Christ. And remember this, God never pawns you off. He always has time for you. That's number one. Number two is distraction. Distraction. How many of us are buried up to here with plans, with things on our calendar? Matter of fact, how many of your days are so full on your calendar you can't put one more note in there? Any of you doing that? Guilty. Guilty. Activity, sports, work. And in the 80s generation, which I'm a part of, I know that seems old to some of you, the 80s generation, what did we have to have in the background and still have to have everywhere we go? Music. 80s, music, MTV, everywhere you go, if you're working, if you're washing your car, if you're in the kitchen cooking, if you're in the shower, you're either singing or you're listening to music somewhere, 80s, that's our thing. Today it's Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, email, text, and Facebook. Always this. You can see it, it's generational, it's distraction. It's distraction. But there's a thing that we need to look at that we forget about. Before Jesus chose his disciples, there was a pattern that he had for us. So if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Literally, I am just preaching from little notes I made all week. 
So, so if it's not smooth, I apologize. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. This is very important to note. The news about Jesus is spreading all over so that the crowds of people came to hear him. And when he talked about crowds, we're not talking 30 or 40 people. We're talking thousands. We're talking whole towns, whole communities. They came near him to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. So with the drugs, with the distraction, with the technology, with all the things we have, the programs, the sports, the relationships that we have to maintain as friends or family, how many of us actually say every day or every other day, I'm going to take a moment just for the purpose of getting alone with God? How many of us have that time? How many of us have to get up in the morning and drive a bus? Wait a few hours, get up and drive another bus again and get home late, have to deal with all those kids and then deal with my own family and travel. Bad roads. I know Gina, I'm picking on you a little bit. It's early in the morning. She probably hasn't even had her coffee yet sometimes. But in the busyness of life, Jesus sets a pattern for us. He says, hey, I was busy too. I was very busy. As a matter of fact, I didn't have 60 people on a bus. I had 6,000. And every time, every moment that I could, I got away. Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. And if you turn over to Luke 6, chapter, or Luke chapter 6, verse 12, before, and I said this last week, but before he chose the 12 disciples from the many that were following him, it says that Jesus spent the night praying to God. And I wanted to repeat this. No, and I said this before. <coughs> But Jesus spent the word dianuterio. Dianuterio is from the root word nuk. N-U-X, actually. It means to sit up all night. But dianuterio means you are so obsessed with one certain item that you cannot sleep and you stay up all night praying about it. Before he made an important decision, he spent the night in prayer. The Son of God himself spent all night praying, God, who are the twelve that you have? For me, who have the raw material to be the disciples? How many of us have done that? What school do you want me to go to, God? What job do you want me to have, God? What mate do you want me to choose as a, as a, as a husband or a wife? What hospital do you want me to go to as we get older? I need that one a lot anymore. How many of us spend all night in prayer and, and withdraw from the busyness of life to say, guys, shut everything off. I'm going upstairs. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get in the closet. Some people do. I think it was, uh, oh, I can't remember. There was a famous preacher. His mom used to sit in the middle of a kitchen and put her apron over her head. And all the children knew when mom had the apron over her head, don't bother her. <clears throat> Wesley. Charles Wesley's mom. She had several kids. Don't bother mom when she's under that apron because she's praying. She needs a moment to herself with God. She's wore out. She needs a moment. And then a little note here. Remember this, that even, G even Superman, even Superman needed a fortress of solitude. How many of you are Superman? Some of you moms, I know you wear capes. We can't see them, but you have them. But you still need a fortress of solitude. You still need a moment to put that cape over your head and take a break. And, re and renew your strength. Get alone with God and say, God, I'm not just going to fly by the seat of my pants anymore. I want to fly with you right here beside me. I want you to help me make these decisions. So if you look at that, when Jesus prayed all night, he picked the 12. He turned them in from students to the ones he sent out. He, he empowered them. He strengthened them. And God gave him the wisdom to pick the right men. And remember, there's a word there, Shalaya, which is in Hebrew, S-H-A-L-I-A-H, Hebrew. It's as if they were, they were so well trained, they were, had been with Jesus, to the point where Shalaya came into effect, which is they went out as legal representatives of Jesus Christ to do his business as if Jesus was there himself. Very important decision. And on that note, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at the call of Jesus. And I bring this up because another issue came up with one of these preachers that's hanging around our president. And she gave a big message on TV in front of a world audience. And that's what her message was. If you had 
6 million TV viewers, maybe 20 million, what would your message be if you were a preacher? I can tell you what hers was. And it's a very powerful message. We need your money. I was very disappointed. You got the world at your fingertips. You got all these cameras on you. And your message is, I need your money? Shame on it. I had a question this week. What about the, what about the people that are living in the gifts and things like that. Listen, if you need those things to worship God, fantastic. I think those went away with the, with the apostles and the prophets. What we need today is people that aren't afraid to preach the Word of God. That's what we don't have. Uncompromisingly stand in a pulpit and say, this is the truth. This is the black and the white of your faith. Not, we need your money. Not we need to dance in the aisles anymore. Hey, if you get excited, fantastic. What we need are people that preach line upon line, precept upon precept, the truth found in the Word of God. We need more preachers that do that. And we don't have it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 9. And here's Paul. Isn't it a debate? And actually, he's being a little sarcastic here. But this is the truth of the situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession. Not the front, at the end. Like men contemned, condemned to die in the arena. No mansions here, no limousines, no private planes. We're like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe. To angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ. And this is where he gets sarcastic. But you are so wise in Christ. We are weak. But you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. And on our rags we are brutally treated. We are homeless. How about that? The call of the apostle. The challenge to the apostle. Ordinary men, remember. Verse 12. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world, the call of an apostle. No private jet, no glittery mansion, no limousine, no fancy clothes. I'm not writing this to your shame, but be warned as my dear children. Even though you have had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel the gospel. What he's saying is, I'm legit. I'm the real deal. You need people like me to tell you when you're wrong. You need people like me to love on you. You need people to train you. You don't need people to put you on drugs and programs and things like that. You need a man like me because you need to imitate me because I imitate Jesus Christ. We don't have that as often today as we need or we need. We're distracted. How are we distracted? Turn to Luke chapter 24. Again, we talked about this in Bible study, but I'm going to talk about it again. Luke chapter 24. You don't want to hear about my dream last night, Paul. I dreamed I preached for an hour and a half this morning. <laughs> I try not to do that. But I did. I remember waking up in my dream. Oh, my goodness. On Luke chapter 24, verse 13, talking about distraction. The issues of the day. This is where I want to kind of merge into the disruption part. If you look at this portion of scripture on the road to Emmaus, we know what's happened. Jesus has been crucified. Um, they just recently found out that he was risen. And we have two men walking back to Emmaus with their heads down, if you look at it. And they're talking to each other. Jesus stands in their midst. And he starts, oh, here you can look at it, verse 17. Jesus walks up to them. They still have their faces down. They are so distracted. They are so preoccupied with their own situation. And as I said, Wednesday night, they're so narrowly minded they can look through a keyhole with both eyes here because they don't even recognize that Jesus shows up with them and starts walking with them. They stood there with their faces down, one of them named Cleopas asked him when Jesus said, what are you discussing together as you walked along? And he says, where have you been? Are you some kind of outsider? Are you new to Jerusalem? 
You don't know about the things that have just recently happened. You weren't watching Fox News. You weren't watching CNN or MSNBC. You didn't know that Jesus Christ was crucified. <coughs> Jesus says, what things are you talking about? They're so distracted. They're so caught up in their own life. They don't see the old lady that needs a little help with the groceries in the parking lot. They're so wrapped up in their own misery, they don't realize that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is walking right with them. And then if you go over to verse 30, you see this, that he goes, he's going to walk away, and they invite him into their house, and he says, let's eat together. And when they were at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. And we use this as an example. How many times have you seen somebody you haven't seen in 30 years? And you're going about your life, and you're, they're talking to you, and you're, it, and they, but you're not really realizing who they are. And then five minutes later, you go, oh, Jerry, yeah, I remember you. Middle Ridge High School, class of 87. Oh, my goodness. I was so wrapped up looking at my Kroger list, I didn't realize it was you. This is what's going on. But this is what I said. We're moving into the disruption part. And this is where I hope this catches on with you. Jesus wants to disrupt your life. He wants to get us out of this distraction, out of this drug-induced coma that we're in in the world, worried about the world. We're not living for here. We're living for the next life. He wants to give you heartburn. Everybody like a good case of heartburn? you got to deal with heartburn. Verse 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures. How many of us hear the still, small voice of Jesus trying to interrupt your life? And how many of us say, not right now, I'm a little busy. We're drugged, we're distracted, we're dis we're, when Jesus is trying to disrupt us. And I just can't help but wonder, how many of us in this room is God trying to call? I don't know why I got this message. There might be somebody here today, and I've known all you now over five years, that somebody, Jesus might be calling you to ministry. Jesus might be calling you to go out and witness to somebody specific. Jesus has a perfect plan just for you. He has a purpose just for you in his sovereignty. He knows your makeup. He knows when you were born. He knows where you came from. He knows more about you than you ever will. And he says, you're the right person for the job. But you're too busy to hear it. Are you hearing the still small voice? Are you feeling the heart burn? Don't ignore it. He's not going to smack you with a sledgehammer. He's not going to run you over with his car and stop trying to get your attention. It's going to be that still small voice. I want to disrupt your life. Maybe some of us need to go home today and spend all night in prayer. And I'll tell you what, if you're a couple, it's hard to do, right? Where's Heidi? She's just sitting here somewhere. It's hard to pray as a couple. It's easy to pray by yourself. But how difficult is it as a couple sometimes to, honey, can we just hold hands and pray for a little bit? For some couples, it's hard. And I know for us sometimes it's hard to do that. Jesus wants to disrupt your life. He wants to make you uncomfortable. He wants to get your attention. He wants to get you out of that comfort zone. He wants you to, Matthew 6, 24, take up your cross and follow me. And this is where I started to meditate this week on this scripture. What exactly does that mean? Well, first of all, in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, a cross is a curse. A cross, and anyone who is hung on a cross, is cursed. Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your shame. Take up your humility. Take up your weaknesses. <coughs> Acknowledge that you are cursed. We're cursed without Jesus Christ. We are cursed to death. We have a curse within us, and the only cure is Jesus Christ. I don't know. I got the cowbell thing on my head. Saturday Night Live, I need a little more cowbell. The only cure is a little more cowbell. The only cure for the death that reigns within us, the curse that we have, is Jesus Christ. <coughs> a little, I need a little more Jesus Christ. That's what we need. Curse is anything that hangs on a cross. If you turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. I'm going to run you all over today. Sorry. Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. 
Take up your cross and follow me from Matthew 16. The cross represents shame. It represents humility. It rep represents obedience, depravity. It represents that I acknowledge that I have a need. Christ cannot disrupt your life until you really realize I have a need. You may be the greatest person in the world. That's fantastic. The issue isn't whether you're good or not. The issue is, has your sin been dealt with? He wants to disrupt your life. And when you can say, I have sin, then you can pick up the cross and follow Jesus Christ. You can pick up that curse, that shame, that humility. And actually today, because of the resurrected Christ, it can also be a symbol of victory. Verse 5, Philippians 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. This is taking up your cross. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In his humanity, he says, I'm not worthy to be like God. I'm emptying myself of God. I'm going to be a man. But made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. What's the world missing today? It's not drugs, it's not programs, it's not distractions, it's not technology, it's humility. We don't have humility anymore. And if you can't be humbled, if you don't have any humility, you're never going to pick up your cross. Because a cross is not glamorous. A cross is not necessarily easy. A cross means you're swimming upstream, not downstream. It says he humbled himself and became obedient to death. And Paul writes, even the death on a cross. To a Hebrew, to a Jew, that's a big deal because it says in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, cursed is anything that is hung on a cross. This is our distraction. Jesus, this is our disruption. Jesus wants to disrupt our life. He wants us to take up that cross. He wants us to follow him. And I'm almost down to my final thought. Take a big sigh. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The curse is anything that's hung on a tree. Jesus Christ was not ashamed to be associated with us. Why would we be ashamed to be associated with him? So now to my final thought. We have drugs. We have distraction. We have the disruption of Jesus Christ, which is through heartburn. We feel his calling. We hear his voice. And then we have a final D destiny. So what's your destiny? Turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19 verses 27 to 30. Jesus has just dealt first of all with the rich man. And the rich man has said, I've followed the law my whole life. I'll do that. I'll do all the good things. I'll give you all my money, all that stuff. Well, not necessarily his money, but he says, I've done everything I need to do as far as the law goes. But I'm not going to follow you, Jesus. So Peter says to him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be there for us? Now what does that mean? He's asking, I, we've left everything, Jesus. We're going to follow you. We've chosen to follow you. We walked away from our boats. Actually, for Peter, John, Andrew, and all, they walked away from a very successful fishing business to follow Jesus Christ. So he's saying, what's going to be there for us? What reward are we going to get for that? And Jesus says this, verse 28, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's to them. Verse 29 is us. And everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, children, or fields for my sake will receive 100 times as much and will inherit eternal life also. 100 times as much and eternal life. Things that cannot be stolen, things that will not be rusting away, things that nobody can ever take away. Verse 30, but many who are first will be last, many who are last will be first, and just to define that, is that people in the world system who look like they're doing fantastic, the Michael Jacksons and the Kardashians and all these people, guess what? When it comes to the dissolving of the world system, 
And God puts his system in place with the dissolving of all things and the beginning of the new heavens and the new earth, they're going to be in last place. You know who's going to be first? Every one of you that said, Jesus, at any expense, I'm going to follow you. Guess who's getting the blue ribbon? You are. Guess who's getting first place? You are. Because it's a new system. It's no longer the satanic system, the system of the world. It's God's new system for eternity. And you're going to be number one. Imagine that. Look in the mirror and tell yourself today I'm number one. You can say that. Maybe you're not here. You're not driving in there with in the parking lot. Not yet. So now I want to go. Where does this all stem from? Job chapter 34. This is what happens when you just read from Rob's notes for the week. I'm going to find Job. It's in the Old Testament. <laughs> Job, chapter 34. Let's take a look at chapter 34. Of course, we know Job is going through a lot. You know the story of Job. Verse 11. God repays a man for what he has done. He brings upon him what his conduct deserves. That means good and bad. It's not just the condemnation of the man because, oh, you've been so bad, God is going to judge you. Remember, he said, if you've left everything, I'm going to give you a hundred times more. He repays a man for what he has done. And then go over to verse 21. His eyes are on the ways of men. He sees their every step. Remember, David said there's a book written just about Beth. There's a book written just about Sandy. There's a book, and your name is at the very top of it, Carrie. His eyes are on the ways of men. He sees their every step. There is no dark place, no deep shadow, where even evil doers can hide. God has no need to examine men further, that they should come to judgment before him. They are, he already knows. He's going to reward you. He sees all. He sees all, and he repays a hundred times for those that have left for the following Jesus Christ. Those of us who ain't on the drugs, who are on the distractions, those who have allowed Jesus Christ to disrupt our lives, we have a very important destiny. We have a beautiful destiny. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. And that speaks of the ropes and the fiery furnace. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to a place from which I carried you in exile. There is a plan to prosper you. There is a plan to redeem you. There is a plan to repay you 100 times what you left. So... <coughs> Final thought. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. If there's any questions after this message, I'll be happy to hang around and talk about it. Because I know I'm all over, but this is what's come up this week when I want to talk. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Is the world getting better today? Easier is your neighbor, more likable. The programs on TV more appropriate. The books we read more enjoyable. Think about this. Matthew 24, verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So my question today is, where do you stand? Are you in the midst of the drugs and the distraction? I'm not saying take the drugs and we're addicted. I'm just saying that's just an example of being uh, pawned off, for example. Are we caught up in the distractions of life? Or are we willing to be disrupted? Are we willing to take a little moment from life and say, I need some solitude. I need some time away. I need 24 hours. I need an hour just with Jesus. Because if you're making that decision, you have a whole other destiny than the people that are not. 
There are two ways set before man in Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 21. There's a way to life, and there's a way that leads to death. If we're drugged and distracted, guess which way we're going? But if we take a moment to lift our head up and recognize Jesus Christ and allow him to disrupt our life, it says, he who stands firm till the end will be saved, will receive a hundredfold. Are you willing to give up what you can't keep for that which you can never lose? I know that's a common phrase, but I want to bring That's what Jesus is asking us to do. That's the culmination of everything. Give this up. You don't need it. I'm going to give you stuff that you can never lose. So just for a temporary amount of time, for 68 years in this earth, why are we striving so hard? Why are we allowing ourselves to be so distracted? All this is is a satanic attempt to pull us away from following Jesus Christ. Move us. Ephesians 2, 2. He is the prince and power of the air. Where do you stand today? So I pray that this was somewhat enlightening. Um, again, this was just one week of notes, of interaction with other people. They were asking me questions. And I guess in, in my own way, I'm even asking myself where I stand as a Christian. Am I willing to be uh, totally distracted for Jesus? It's easy to get caught up in this world, isn't it? It's easy to look at the things in our garages and in our living rooms and go, well, I'll tell you what, four times this week I made a purpose after thinking about this, to do something different. And I, well, Casey, the kids were with me one time. We stopped to help a broke down car. We stopped to give somebody a ride. We bought the lunch for the guy behind us. And we did one other thing. And I thought, that's the way I'm going to live from now on. Whatever it takes. When God puts that burning in my heart to see an individual, and he says, give him 20 bucks. Give them 50 bucks. Give them 100 bucks. Guess what I'm doing? I'm going to pull it out of my pocket and hand it right to them. Let's just see what God does with that. I'm going to live a life disrupted. So going, getting out of this pastoral comfort zone, if it is, I mean, I'm on call 24-7 and I don't mind that. Oh, we went and spent time with Scott and Hannah. It was fantastic. Got to meet their family. We're going to dis be disrupted. Are you willing to live a disrupted life this week? Forget about keeping your head down, looking at your own life. Lift your head up. And look out and say, who needs me today as a child of God? <coughs> Allow God to disrupt your life. Allow Him to make a difference. Spend all night in prayer and see the decisions that God can make for you to use you with what you have here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. We're all sinners saved by grace. Praise God. We are all.